Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome back. Okay, so uh, I think you have seen this uh, new slides and we're going to enter this new chapter. So it's basically a review for some elementary data structures. Okay, and I found that this is quite uh, necessary um, before we uh, take one more step towards the next chapter, which is our last chapter for this semester uh, about graph algorithms. And the graph algorithms actually uh, involve uh, a pretty big amount of knowledge, uh, including data structure and some of the um, algorithms like greedy algorithms that we introduced before. So it's a pretty comprehensive chapter. So I found it's, um, it'll be easier to get started if we have some review about some elementary data structure first. So that's why we will have this lecture, um, this chapter eight, lecture eight for purely for data structure. Yeah, so um, the data structures that we're gonna cover uh, here will be useful. I mean, most of them will be useful for the, um, for the graph algorithms. And I think it's also like having a review about these uh, fundamentals would be a beneficial to uh, um, computer science students in, in general. Okay. okay, so the contents that we will cover includes, first of all, a, an abstract concept about dynamic sets, okay, which basically includes the following items like stack and queues, uh, uh, the binary search trees, and disjoint sets, okay? So when we talk about the um, first abstract concepts, dynamic sets, it's actually not a specific uh, data structure. It's not an implemented data structure, but it's a concept that provides some uh, interfaces or general methods that uh, these more concrete data structure like stack and queues and binary search tree should support, okay? So I guess many of you are familiar with the stack and queues. And I think we have also covered a bit of that before the, the previous uh, uh, few lectures, right? We mentioned uh, the minimal priority queues, right? We used, uh, uh, I'm not sure if we used stack before. Yeah, but for sure we, we're gonna, uh, meet stack and queues again in graph algorithms. And the tree structures uh, for particularly, in particularly uh, for the, uh, for our course, for our lecture today, we're gonna cover binary search tree. So this binary search is kind of an algorithm that we uh, have already encountered in the first assignments, right? So, and also in the first midterm, so it's, uh, Basically, a, a, uh, there's some divide and conquer thinking in there, but now we wrap up the, the algorithm into some data structure, uh, tree-like data structures. And those tree structures is something that we will also uh, encounter again when we talk about uh, graph algorithms later. And lastly, for disjoint sets. Okay, so this is a special type of data structure that are useful <clears throat> in describing, um, describing the relationships between um, nodes that are uh, connected towards each other, which is a basis for uh, characterizing a complete graph data structure, okay? So you see all of these are uh, pretty uh, correlated. Um, yeah, let's get started from the uh, concept of dynamic uh, sets, okay? So it's basically a kind of set, 
but it's uh, a bit different from the mathematical concept of set because uh, the set that we talk about in computer science is a uh, dynamic one, which means that we can change the size of a set. Like we can uh, take one element out or take one, uh, add more elements into the set. Okay. And usually we will describe the elements in the dynamic sets using the concept of objects, right? So in object, in object uh, oriented designing uh, thoughts, we usually can uh, attach some attributes to one object. And the most important attributes that we uh, would like those objects to have include the key and the satellite data, okay? So these key and satellite data, they are attached to the objects, okay? So these two concepts are something that we're gonna find um, uh, pretty commonly used when we uh, uh, describe um, the, the elements or, or verticals or uh, vertices in, 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 gra in a graph data structure. Okay, so for example, a, no, a, a, gra a vertex in a graph can have a key value, can also have a, um, um, have a weight. Uh, uh, maybe for vertex is not a, a best example, but the, the, the edges between those vertices, we can describe it using weights, right? And the weight may uh, represent, for example, the distance between two uh, uh, connecting nodes. And, no, and these nodes can be the, the cities on the map, right? So it's like a really flexible uh, design that the, we can attribute, we, we can attach a different kinds of attributes to objects, okay? But the keys and the satellite data are the most uh, commonly used terms to describe those uh, attributes, okay? So, for the common operations on dynamic sets, there's usually two types. The first one is query and the second one is modifying. Okay, so it's a abstract um, categorization. Like uh, basically a query doesn't change the states of all the dynamic sets. It doesn't cause the dynamic set to, to grow or to shrink in size, right? But a modifying uh, operation can um, make changes to the set. Okay, and typically the queries um, operations are those that can return the information about set. For example, the co a common type of query is often used, often defined, use the term search, like given a set that we want to know about, and we will use some key value as the inputs for the search uh, procedure. And the, basically the, the search will return some elements that um, matches the, the key values. So that's the, the keys equals the, the target key that we are interested in, okay? So actually I think we should put the insert and the delete not under the query type, but really it should be the modify, the, the modification or modifying uh, operations because when we insert some um, elements with some certain key values, we're gonna change the change the shape, change the size of the, uh, of the dynamic set. And of course, after we delete some elements, the size is gonna be changed, okay? So these are like basically abstract interfaces that a dynamic set should support, okay? So next we're gonna uh, talk about the first concrete example, which is stacks and queues. Okay, so um, as a comparison, uh, we, we can use a lot of like objects to, to real world objects to, to represent a stack. Like if you put a, a pancakes in a plate, 
yeah, so it's a typical example of the uh, stack uh, data structure. And a, the most uh, important principle of a stack is the so-called last in and first out principle. Okay, so intuitively in this picture, the one, the pancake you put at the bottom of the plate, right? It's not that easy to take it out. So generally speaking, you want to take the pancake on top of it, right? So the last, the last, uh, the, the pancake that last came in will be served first out, right? So as a comparison on the other side, the queue data structure is like first in first out. So imagine you have a long queue of customers in a bank, then basically the first one who arrived first will be served uh, as the first customer, okay? All right, so in let's look at uh, how we uh, achieve this uh, principle of last in first out for stacks. So uh, it is not nothing fancy, right? So it's it at the uh, so um, we, we need to implement the data structure use some elementary use some uh, primitive types, okay? That a computer program supports, okay? So we can use actually a simple array, okay? To to implement a stack. And this array we called S, it can have at most n elements in it. And that, that is the, some limit we need to place uh, to the data structure. So what we're gonna do is to define some attributes. This attribute is called top, okay? And this S dot top is an index. Okay, it's a pointer. It points to the most recently inserted element. Okay, you can think of it as an integer uh, index. Okay, and so if there are more than one element in the stack, then if we use S1 to access the element, then it is the one at the bottom, while S dot top. Okay, if we use this s dot top, use this integer number as the index, and we put it between these uh, square brackets, then this is an element that is at the top. It's the, the top pancake uh, that we can access. Okay, so if you uh, look at this uh, um, visualized uh, stacks, um, I should have removed these numbers. Okay, so it basically shows uh, how we can think of the elements. Uh, we can think of an, uh, a, a just a ordinary uh, array as a stack. Okay, as as long as we have some uh, these s dot top attributes used. Okay, so this area on the left we have uh, four elements. Okay, and the s dot top is four, which points to this element nine, right? So if we start at this stage and then we push, we add some elements into it, then we're gonna have 17 and three, right? Inserted into the stack. And then that means our stop will grow by two, right? Because the nine here is no longer the top element okay, is not no is no longer the most recently inserted element, okay. But instead, we should let s dot top point to three, okay. All right. So that's a first look of the stack, and then we're gonna look at the, some basic operations. Okay. First of all, it's called stack empty. So it's basically a query. Okay. It's a query that's um, that ask the stack to tell uh, if it's empty or not. Okay, it basically returns a, a, a boolean. Um, and more importantly, we're gonna look at the uh, next two operations, which are push, okay, and pop, okay? So we don't use the term insert and delete because conventionally 
uh, when we describe when uh, uh, describe the the stack data structure, uh, it's a convention to use push and pop to to describe the inserts and the deletes operations. Okay, so the one special place about the pop is that um, we don't need to like designate which element to delete because we can only delete the top elements in the stack. Okay, so that's why the stack, when we call pop, it shouldn't take any of our arguments. Okay, the data structure should recognize which one uh, is the top element and then delete that top uh, element. Okay, so if we look at the uh, implementations, right? If say uh, the, we want to check whether the stack is empty or not, then we will simply look at the, the top uh, pointer. We look at the top index, okay? So if it points to zero, which means there's no element in it. So we simply return true, otherwise it's false. Right, it's straightforward. And in the push uh, um, procedure, what we're gonna do is to increase the top uh, attributes by one. It's like in a previous slide, it's like move the arrow, right? There's a arrow that indicates the top pointer, right? We move that top pointer to the right by one position. And then we uh, will copy the new uh, elements that we want to push into the stack. We, we assign that new element to the, uh, to the new position uh, pointed by the S dot top, right? So push is also easy, okay? So in the pop uh, procedure, so there's a step of check of checking whether the stack is uh, empty, right? So it tells this if statement tells uh, whether the stack is empty or not. So if it's already empty and still we are trying to delete some elements from it, it will return an underflow um, error, right? So theoretically, if we want a push algorithm to work properly, we probably also need to check whether that uh, uh, stack is already full, okay? Because uh, if we don't set such a limit to the maximum capacity of stack, it's gonna be uh, trouble uh, if we're gonna spend our program to, to, to use a lot of computer memories, okay? So contrary to the push, the pop will like decrement the top by one, okay? So it's a delete the, so it uh, decreases the top by one, but before the, 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 the elements being popped will be returned, okay? Use this plus one, okay? Because the top is already delete, is de decremented by one. So we need to uh, access the previous position of top by, uh, plus one uh, by this uh, plus one here, okay? So the elements being popped out will be returned, okay? So these are the two other basic operations, okay? So the there are two types of arrows about stack. One is called the underflow, which we uh, just uh, saw in the previous slide. Uh, it occurs when we attempt to pop some empty stack and the other, uh, arrow is overflow. And I think you may be more familiar with this arrow because um, there's a famous website called Stack Overflow, which means that the term itself means that uh, the, the top pointer of the stack exceeds the array size, okay? So when we define an array, for example, in, in uh, lower level computer languages, we need to specify the the, the maximum size of it, it's a, it's, a, it's a fixed value actually. So if the top exceeds that value, then it causes the stack overflow issue. Okay, so that's so much for stack, okay? All right, and then let's look at the queue. And 
for the queue here, we actually gonna have a chance to look at some uh, more advanced uh, uh, versions, okay, rather than other than the the, sim the simplest uh, queue implementation. Okay, so if it's the most uh, uh, the simplest uh, implementation, the simplest version for queue, it should support the in queue operation. And this in queue means that we insert some element to a queue. And the delete operation is called dequeue. Okay, so these are also conventions. Okay, and this dequeue also doesn't take an argument. Okay, because remember the principle of a queue is like first in, first out. So the, for the elements that first uh, inserted, that, that is first inserted to the queue will be naturally the one being uh, deleted first. Okay, so that order is also kind of fixed. Okay, so the DQ will not take an argument. Okay, so um, what's different from the stack is that in stack, we just need to uh, use the one index, which is s dot top, right? To indicate the uh, position that the uh, push and pop uh, operations need to be conducted, but the queue needs to have two pointers basically. Okay, so we call it a head and a tail. Okay, so whenever an element is in queued, it will take the position at the tail. Okay, that's almost the, the end of this. Another way to say it is the end of the queue. Okay, and it's just like, yeah, it's just like the newly arriving customer at the end of the line, okay? And on the other side, the element dequeued is always the one at the head, okay? Because we assume that the one at the head is the, the first one being in queued. Is the, is the elements that is in queued the earliest among all the elements, okay? All right, so um, implementation wise, um, we still use an array, okay? And this time we call it a queue. Um, and this queue has elements one to N, okay? A little bit difference here is that we will uh, have a limit that's at most N minus one elements. It's not N elements, but N minus one elements will be considered as a queue, as a member to a queue. Okay, so uh, we will use the attribute hat and let it point to the, the hat position and the tail, q.tail points to the next location. And this specialty about the tail is that it points to the next location at which a newly arriving element will be inserted, which means this insertion doesn't happen yet. So the position that q dot tail points to is actually an uh, unoccupied. It's a basically an empty cell in the area. Okay, there's nothing in it. Okay, but it, it is to be uh, inserted. Okay, so it is not the the q the the tail doesn't points to doesn't points to exactly the last element in the queue. Okay, so that that's a little bit uh, difference here. Okay. So, so the elements uh, that exist in the queue actually starts from head, okay? And it ends at tail minus one, okay? So I think it's for the convenience. So this setup is for the convenience of uh, inserting the uh, uh, new elements into the queue, okay? Um, so the, uh, we will make some uh, little bit trade off so that we will have one less element uh, than the Q, than a tail position, right? Okay. So another important fact about this type of implementation is that the queue is actually uh, circular. Okay, so. This is a, an important property. Um, we're gonna see some examples later in the next slides. 
And uh, generally speaking, this circular property uh, makes the queue very flexible to, to uh, no matter to in queue or DQ elements. So uh, the basic property is that the index one actually immediately follows the index n. Okay, so the next elements, for example, if you have uh, n minus one elements in it, right? So the next position, uh, the next index would be n, right? And then the next one, if you go one more step after n, it actually returns to index one. That is a property necessary to implement the, the Q data structure, okay? So whenever you have the head pointer and the tail pointer, if they point to the same position, okay? That actually means the queue is empty, which means there's nothing in it. And in that way, the, the, the two pointers overlap each other, okay? So we're gonna see some examples of the queue, okay? And initially, the, the head and queue also starts at the same position because there's no element in it, but we will let it start at the, at the uh, a special index, which is one, okay? So next we're gonna see some examples, okay? So the in queue, we will start example with the in queue and the DQ, okay? So these are two uh, simplified in queue and DQ because we don't uh, explicitly check the arrows, okay? So in this in queue uh, procedure, the actual insertion operation is just one line of code, okay? It's just uh, copy the elements to the uh, array cell pointed by the queue.tail because we said that the tail actually points to the next uh, position to be inserted, right? So after that is done, then we need to increase the tail pointer, right? Just like what we did to a stack, we need to increase the, the, the top uh, pointer, right? We, we need to do the same thing to tail, okay? But we, if this increasing the pointer step, is actually a little complex because we need to check whether the tail has reached the, the maximum length of the queue. So this queue is essentially an array and the, the length of array is, is a fixed error, is a fixed uh, value, it uh, has a limitation. So we basically want to check if tail has reached the boundary, okay? So if that boundary is already, uh, reached, we will, what we're gonna do is to let the tail point to the one, the first elements of the array, okay? So this makes the circular nature of the uh, queue, okay? So this, of course, there, there could be a conflict, conflict because the, the one could be still uh, with there could be still occupied if the, the head is point to one. So that's why we say this in queue doesn't check the, the queue overflow or underflow errors, okay? But uh, here we just for a to want to use um, a simplified demonstration here, okay? And if that is not the case, if the tail doesn't reach the end of the, uh, end of the array, we will simply increment tail by one, okay? So that's the simplified in queue. And the simplified DQ uh, is um, um, more or less the same uh, operations we need to follow. So first we will access the elements pointed by the head, okay? so. You see the difference now. The difference between stack is that the positions to DQ and to in queue and elements in the queue is at the two ends. It's not the same position. When we DQ an element, we will look at the head position, right? So we will copy that element out, okay? But we're gonna um, 
also examine whether the head has reached the lens. Okay, if the head is the last elements of the array, then we need to set it back. We need to make it circular because the head is already end. Then we need to move it back to the to the to the to the head, to the to the to the to the, to the first elements in the array. Okay. Otherwise, we just uh, increment the head by one. Okay. And then the elements being dequeued will be returned. Okay, so uh, that's two simplified uh, versions. And if we look at the uh, demo, look at this visualized uh, queue structure. It's like we have a uh, array that is fixed length that has twelve, right? At most twelve elements in it. So we have head points to seven, which means that this is the uh, elements that will be dequeued if we, if we call a dequeue operation on it, okay? And the queue.tail points to the 12 here, which means that if we add, insert a new element, it will appear here, okay? So, um, and after this element is inserted, then the tail needs to be incremented to one, okay? So the next uh, possible place to insert would be the, the, the uh, first element in, in, the, uh, in the array queue, okay? All right. So, uh, and again, if we gonna dequeue the elements, we're gonna first, uh, uh, delete the 15 out and the head will increment by one by moving uh, one towards right. Okay, that's the Q operations. Yeah, so um, basically this, uh, we will use an example to show how the shapes of the Q, how the elements uh, changes after we call it DQ and NQ. So what about so we NQ and elements seven into this uh, um, queue in such a configuration, okay? We're gonna input 17, okay? And three, and then five, there are uh, three elements, right? So it's gonna be like this. The 17 will be in queued here, and then the three will be here, five will be here, and the tail will point to the next position to be in queued, which is the one after the second element, okay? And the head doesn't change because we didn't dequeue any elements. What about now we dequeue, call the function dequeue once, okay? That means we will move the head one position to the right, okay? And then this, 15 within the Q7 position is no longer considered as a Q element, okay? So this number is still there. According to our algorithm, the number is still there, but it doesn't matter because we don't consider it. It's, it's not within the range of head and tail, okay? So it's possible that we can keep uh, in Q elements, right? We can keep insert, insert elements, until that we reach this point and then we cover, we will rewrite, overwrite this older value 15 here, okay? But it's okay because right now the dark gray area that is between the tail and the head that is not covered by the head and tail is not considered as a member of the Q data structure. All right, that's DQ. And similarly, we will have uh, underflow and uh, overflow errors. So whenever we want to attempt to uh, dequeue from an empty queue, right, then we will, there will be an underflow uh, error triggered. And the uh, condition actually of uh, detecting a, an empty uh, queue is quite interesting. We will basically need to look at the position, the relative positions of the head pointer and the tail pointer. So the empty condition is that the, these two pointers needs to point to the same position, okay? So that is a case that uh, uh, we will have an empty queue. And the overflow is also 
um, an issue when we attempt to enqueue to a queue that, that is already full. And the full condition is that the head is uh, one ahead of the tail or the head is one, but the tail is uh, reaches the, the length of it. Okay, so these two conditions need to be uh, both considered because the queue is a circular. Okay, it's not a um, linear structure, it's a circular structure. We need to consider the relative positions between head and queue, head and tail. All right, so that's uh, the simply the simplest version of Q. And in practice, we um, will most commonly use the, we, first of all, we want the data structure to be flexible, okay? So that's why we would have the double-ended, we would have the double-ended uh, Q instead of a simple Q. And this Q is called double-ended uh, because we will allow insertion and the deletion at both ends, okay? So the previous Q example is only allowed for insertion at the tail position, but uh, only, and only uh, DQ at the head position, okay? But that somewhat is not that flexible. And this DQ, the double-ended Q uh, would be uh, more flexible because um, in this way, we will um, better manipulate data at both ends. So that means we need to uh, implement not just the in-queue, but we need to specify the way to in-queue at the head and the in-queue at the tail. Okay, meanwhile, we need to define a way to DQ at the head and the DQ at the tail positions. Okay, so um, as an example, uh, we will show the tail in queue here. So the difference is that um, um, we will um, basically check whether uh, um, that tail is already uh, reached the, the length of the queue, which is the same as the uh, as the original uh, in queue, right? So this tail in in queue is basically the same. As the traditional, uh, as the in queue for the for the um, uh, previous uh, simple simplest queue example, and the difference is that for the head, okay, so this head uh, head in queue means that we need to copy the elements to the uh, element to the position pointed by the queue dot head, right? So the next step of checking the statements. The, the checking the uh, how to increment head is that we need to check whether the queue that the head points to one, right? If if so, we need to because we need to decrement the head. But since a queue is circular, if we decrement the head that is at one, we need to move it to the right end to the length, right? And in other case, we need to decrement head by one. So the difference is that if we um, insert at the tail, we need to increase the tail, right? But if we insert at the head, then we need to decrease the head. So that is basically how the difference uh, for the two ends of a queue. Okay. So that's. Uh, double-ended queue, right? Which is a commonly used data structure. And what we're gonna cover a bit about is the so-called priority queue, okay? So it's uh, a more advanced version of queue. Basically, it has a, such a property. We need to have each item uh, associated with a priority score, okay? So it's, it comes with a, some value. And this priority score can be some, uh, the so-called satellite data uh, to each uh, object's elements in the queue, okay? So that priority score will tell which element to be dequeued first, okay? The one with the highest priority will be dequeued, okay? 
okay? It's not just uh, determined by the first in first out principle, okay? But if there's a tie, if there are two elements that uh, had the same, have the same priority score, then that is the case that we need to still follow the first in first out principle of for a general queue because it's it's after all it's still a, a queue data structure right okay. so the way that we uh implement a priority queue is that we um use the some uh heap data structure binary heap data structure so we know that uh, we, we have encountered the, the max heap when we uh, define heap sort, right? So the case uh, that we're gonna cover here is called the, the minimal priority queue that it will be implemented using a minimal, uh, minimal heap, okay? So this minimal priority queue is something we're gonna use in the graph data structure when we want to solve, or we want to sort all the vertices in the graph by the relative uh, weight that you have, okay? So in this special case, in this minimal priority queue, it means that for each element, we will assign a key value to it. And the element with the minimal key value has the highest priority, okay? It seems opposite to the priority queue, but it's just a simple manipulation, right? We can use a priority, um, we can change the logics of a priority queue a little bit so that the one with the lowest score will have the highest priority. Okay, so as I said, the minimal priority queue can be uh, implemented with a minimal heap. And for heap, what we know is that uh, we're familiar with the max heap, okay? So the max heap is like the one, is a, is a tree-like structure. So the roots node, here, the root node here will have the maximum value, but that is max heap. But in here, since we need to implement a minimal heap, then the one here has the minimal uh, value. So the property for a minimal heap is that the node, the parent node always have greater values, uh, have smaller uh, values than the, the children nodes, okay? So the parents, uh, has smaller numbers than the children nodes. So this uh, needs to apply to all the nodes in the in the heap, okay? So remember how we store a minimal heap is still to use uh, a array, an array, right? So if we lay out all the elements into an array, it's like this, okay? But it's easy to, to compute the, uh, the, the children, parents and children uh, relationships by computing the indices, okay? So um, the DQ, if we look at the DQ operation of it, of this uh, minimal heap, um, if we, because it's a, it's a minimal priority Q, right? The, the elements being DQ'd, will be the elements at the root node. So in this case, the root one will be dequeued, right? So what, what we gonna do like in practical is that we can swap, for example, we can swap the last elements with the root elements, right? So that's the 16 will be here. And when we shrink the heap size by one, Right, and we uh, exclude the last node, okay? And then the one will be returned, but since the 16 is up here and it violates the minimal heap uh, property. So what we're gonna do is to call some function called mean heapify, okay? It's very similar to the max heapify uh, function, but it maintains the, the minimal, minimal heap property, okay? So we know that the mean heapify is similar to the max heapify, which runs in big O of logarithm n time, okay? Which means that this DQ and in Q uh, operation to a minimal priority Q is not constant time, okay? It's not that fast, okay? It's not as fast as a, as a, uh, a regular Q. 
okay? Because it comes with the price of maintaining the relative positions of these elements in it, maintaining the priority score. No matter when we have a new element comes in, we need to basically put it into the appropriate position so that the next one being dequeued will be correctly uh, uh, inferred, okay? So uh, the minimum part of Q is not a, uh, a cheap uh, data structure, okay? But still we can use some uh, ways to optimize the in Q and the DQ data structure. But that is not, uh, that is outside the scope of our chapter here today, okay? Right, so that's for minimal priority Q. So for comparison, uh, the Q data structure and the stack data structure, the basic insertion and, uh, and uh, deletion operations, they are very uh, fast. They are basically in constant running time. We just uh, need to uh, carefully uh, take care of the, the underflow and the overflow issues, then uh, it's a pretty fast operation. Okay, so next we're gonna cover this uh, second type of data structure called uh, binary search trees. Okay, so it's uh, basically a tree structure and we represent a tree with some linked data structure. Okay, all these nodes in this tree are linked. Okay, and the node is an object. Okay, so here are some just notations. So this object's node should contain the uh, keys and the satellite data. And the most importantly, you should have the left pointer that points to the node's left child and the right pointer that points to the node's right child. Okay, and also the parents, which is P for short, which points to the node parents. Okay, so these are the uh, most important three pointers that we need to uh, know about. Okay, so the most important property, which makes a binary search tree, a binary search tree, okay, is that If X is a node in it, then if Y is a node in the left subtree of X, okay, so Y could be any node in the left subtree of X, then the key of Y is lower than or equal to the key of X, okay? And if y is a node in the right subtree of x, then the key of y should be greater than or equal to the key of x, okay? So it's like a tree structure that have this uh, um, binary split, okay? It's like the one in the middle, the one in the, in the as the parent node is always the, the ha has the median value. It's greater than the, all the children, in the left branch, and all it's always lower than the all the children in the in the in the right branch. So that's a so-called binary search tree property. Okay. So if you look at this example, the five here, right? It's greater than this two, and smaller than this five, right? And so we use this, oops. Okay, so if you look at the, first of all, the, if you look at the root node, it's six, right? So the, all the nodes in the left subtree, which includes the two, five, and five, they are smaller than the six. And all the nodes on the right, which is seven and eight, they are greater than the node, the parent node is six in the middle, okay? And this property applies to each node in the tree. So if you focus on the node here, five here, the left node two is smaller than five. 
and the right node five is greater than five. Okay. And also to these two, it's also the uh, uh, principle uh, holds true, right? So the eight is greater than the parent node seven because eight is in the right branch, in the right subtree of the, of the node seven here. Okay. So that's the binary search tree property. Okay. So next we're gonna look at a procedure that prints all the keys in a binary search tree. And it's also, it's a simple uh, recursive algorithm and it's called in order tree work. Okay. So given a binary search tree, what we're gonna do is to print uh, the, all the elements in the tree in such an order, okay? So if given a node X, if the node is empty, uh, then it points to it, it points to the, the, the now, right? So we don't need to do anything. But if not, we're gonna walk through, first walk through the left subtree of X, okay? So it's a recursive call to the left, okay, to the left of X, okay? And then it will print the element in the middle, which is X dot key, okay? Which is the X itself here. And then we call the in order tree walk on the right, okay? So I guess this has been covered in a data structure course, right? But uh, we're gonna see that uh, it's interesting that we can switch the orders of these statements so that the different orders can be printed, okay? So the in order actually refers to the fact that we print the key of the roots between printing it, uh, the left and the right subtrees, okay? So uh, similarly, we can like switch from line two of line two, line three and line four, switch the orders of these three codes so that we can define the pre-order or post-order uh, uh, printing operations for a binary search tree, okay? So in this example here, if we're gonna print the in-order tree work, okay? and assume that we call this in order tree work on uh, the node six. What it's gonna do is to call as the uh, algorithm indicates, as the algorithm is defined, it will call first call the um, in order tree work on the subtree, on the left subtree, which is five, right? And it will call the, uh, within the call of this subtree on five, it will call subtree two, right? And this in order subtree two will print two because the left child is, is, is now and the right child is also now. So it will only compute, it only print two. So the two will be the first one be, being uh, printed. And then it, it's, it will return to the parent node five, right? And remember there's an in-order tree uh, work on the five here, right? The next five will be the five here, okay? And this call will print five, right? And then we need to go up again into the blue print, okay? Which is the, the blue statement, which is the prints of this parent node six, okay? And the print of six is, the after print of six is done, it will call, uh, in order tree on the on the on the seven right, which is the right child node, and the seven will print print seven, and then recursive call on the in order tree work on eight, it will, which will print eight. So the order of prints, if we're gonna uh, use in order tree work, it's gonna be basically from let me erase all the printing. It's gonna from B from two to five and five and six and seven and eight, okay? So it's uh, in order three walk. And it's what, what if we're gonna look at the running time of it? So because the tree rooted uh, has, at, at, uh, we assume that the, the, the tree has n nodes, okay? 
then the tree walk will run in a big theta of n time. So in order to prove that, it's actually, uh, because we don't know the shape of the tree, right? If it's a, a perfectly balanced tree, like we have equal numbers of the left, for the left subtree and the right subtree, then we can basically use uh, master theorem to get an estimation, right? Because the to, to recursive call on the sub left subtree would be half the size of the original problem and the right tree would also be half the size. But since the, the binary search tree doesn't guarantee that property, okay? So we don't know whether the two subtrees have the equal size. So we basically need to use uh, substitution method to prove such a, such a uh, uh, running time uh, uh, recurrence equation, okay? So what we're gonna do is to assume that the left subtree has K nodes and the right subtree has uh, N minus K minus one because there's one in the middle and there's N in total. So the right one would be N minus K N minus one. All right, so if we use capital T to indicate the running time for the original problem, then it will be uh, the original problem T of N should be bounded by the T of K, which is the time for the recursive call, time for the in-order in prints on the left node, on the left subtree, and T of N minus K minus one will be the running time for the right subtree, right? And plus some D because this, some, this is the constant for print uh, the current node and the return, the call, uh, the, the cost for return to the, uh, return the results, right? So these are just some constants cost. So what we can do is to use substitution method to prove that T of N is actually bounded by this linear function. Okay, so this is something that you can uh, read the textbook. There's a chapter, uh, there's a, a, a pretty uh, detailed uh, proof done, okay? So what we're gonna do, what basically you can do is to substitute this inequality into the two terms on the, on the, over the right. And then you can find that it actually makes the whole inequality hold, hold, okay? So that's the running time for this uh, uh, print uh, uh, function. But, and also actually in theory, it, it makes sense, right? Because there are N elements and if it's an array and if you want to uh, print the, all the elements once, then it's just uh, uh, makes sense to, to cost you linear time, right? All right. So next we can look at the query method. Okay, so this search method is for uh, searching a node with the given key. Okay, so what we're gonna, what we are curious about is that given a key, how do we know whether it exists in the tree or not? Okay, if so, then we want the algorithm to return a node with that matched key, okay? All right, so this uh, um, algorithm is also a recursive algorithm, okay? So the inputs is the, is the, um, um, the given key, okay? And the, and the root node of the tree, okay? So what we're gonna do is that if the node so X is a node, okay? So the initial call would uh, be applied to the, uh, to the, to the uh, root node, but this, since this algorithm will be recursively called. So uh, the, we will we'll just uh, say X is just a node of the tree, okay? So if that node is null or the, the match key value is found, we will return the node, okay? So we will simply follow the binary search key property, okay? Then if the key is smaller than the, the key of X, which means the target value is in the left branch, is in the left subtree of X. So we don't need to 
look at the right subtree because the binary, the binary search tree property guarantees that all everything greater than X will be over the right brown tree, over the right subtree, right? So we just need to look at the left subtree. So by we'll simply return the results of this uh, recursive call on the X dot left, right? And otherwise, if the target key is greater than the key of X, we can look at the, we can return the results on the right subtree. Okay, so this is something similar to the uh, binary search algorithm, right? But since now we uh, wrapped up everything in the left and right um, data structure, it's kind of a tree structure, but essentially it's the same um, binary search algorithm done uh, within this tree search algorithm. So this algorithm will, if we're gonna search a whole tree, it's gonna start at the root and the trees are passed downward. Okay, and for each node, it will compare the key with the uh, with the with the node key. Okay, if they are equal, then terminate. If it's smaller, then we'll search the left subtree. Otherwise, we're gonna search the right subtree. So this is a, a uh, reasonable way to to find the the, the uh, matching node in a subtree. Okay. So as an example here. For example, we're gonna find where the elements, uh, where the key value 13 is, right? So we will call this tree search on this X node. Since the 15 X dot key is 15, which is greater than 13. So which means we need to search the left subtree. So we're gonna call the tree search on X dot left, which means we will search on Y, right? And then we compare the key of Y with 13, which means we need to search the right subtree of the node Y, right? So we will call Y dot right. And then, which means we go to Z and the Z again is smaller than 13, which means we need to go to right again. And then uh, searching the Z dot right, we will have a match, which means the current node is the one we want. So we will return T, okay? So, the search tree forms a simple path downward, which is from 15 to six to seven to 13. And though, so this information gives us some hints about how fast this algorithm is. And basically, because at most we should let the algorithm to uh, flow down from the root node to the bottom node, which means the running time is uh, proportionate to the height of the tree, okay? And we know that the height of a tree is a kind of a, uh, the logarithm of the, uh, at the level of the logarithm of the total nodes in a tree, okay? So this is a, a recursive uh, definition of the tree search. And you may recall that for the binary search problem in our assignments, we have um, also uh, introduced the, the non-recursive one, the iterative one. So similarly, we can basically rewrite the algorithm in an in a iterative style for the binary search tree. Okay, so it's like unrolling the recursion into a while loop, okay? So the parts that we gonna uh, keep the algorithm run is this while loop, okay? So we'll keep the, body run until we find a, a non, um, so either we find a non uh, uh, node that has non values or we find a match, right? So otherwise we're gonna uh, go into these two branch, one of these each two branches. So if the key is smaller than the, the, the current node, then we basically need to search the left one. So we will make the next key, we will make, make the next node to be the left child of the current X. Otherwise we're gonna make X the right child of X to be the, to be the next uh, node, okay? And then uh, the X, uh, the terminate, after it's terminated, the, the X will, after the loop, after the while loop terminates, we will return the, the element X, okay? So, Next, we're gonna uh, cover this slide for the maximum, minimum and the maximum uh, uh, values in the uh, uh, elements or node in the tree, okay? So the one, the node with the minimum key, okay? 
so it's an interesting uh, question because we know that uh, the left subtree is always smaller than the parent node. So that means if we want to find the smallest key, we always need to go left, right? If we go right, then it's wrong because it will be bigger values than the parents. So we just need to follow the right child pointers until we hit nothing, right? We hit the, the, the bottom levels, hit the leaf nodes. So that's a really um, uh, uh, easy uh, question to deal with. So given we will start from X and then until we uh, find that the left node is now, then we will return. We will keep tracing down toward uh, along the left child uh, path. Then we will return the, uh, the, the, the parent node X, okay? So for the right node, we will also do the same thing for the right child, for the for the for the right child pointers. Okay, we just need to follow the right child pointers. Let the x to be the uh, to be its own left to be its own right child, and then we'll keep this until there's no more right child to 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 trace down, and then we will return the x. Okay, so these are really um, uh, interesting properties. Are Interesting operations resulted from the binary search properties. Okay, so for the successor and the predecessor, we're gonna uh, leave it to the next class because it will it's closely related to the insertion and the deletion operations. Okay, and I hope hopefully this uh, lecture uh, for elementary data structure would be helpful for you to prepare the uh, next. Uh, uh, major chapter for graph algorithms. And I think it's a really uh, fun to, to have this exercise um, for this uh, fundamentals computer science knowledge. Okay, so that's so much for it. So I will release the, uh, I think I already did the release the slides and uh, maybe in the previous so slides, there's a couple of typos I wanna fix and I'm gonna release uh, one quiz question later tonight. I haven't done that. Uh, I haven't put in the questions to the canvas yet, but we will do that uh, before tonight. Yes. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, there's no questions. 